All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Christopher Pellegrini, who is a shochu and awamori expert, author, host, diehard Tokyo Swallows fan, and a general booze nerd. Christopher, how you doing? Good. How you doing? Thank you for having me on, Timmy. I appreciate it. Of course, man. Thanks for coming on. And do you prefer Christopher or is Chris what you go by? Like, I tell people Christopher ends up being Chris. Over here in Japan, it's shortened to Kudi sometimes, so whatever. <laughs> there we go. There, I'll stick with Christopher. Well, awesome, man. Okay. We like to jump right in. So if you could start with telling cool. us a little bit more about yourself and what you like to do for fun, that'd be great. All right. Um, I'm, a, I'm a nerd, I guess is one way to put it. I am a booze hound. I've been in the trade, in the, in the beverage alcohol industry since I was basically too young to drive. And that has led me on a very winding journey to Japan where I have lived for the past 20 years and am a government designated ambassador for the, the country's national spirits and not the ones that are spooky, the ones that you drink. And I've been doing that for quite a while as you know, traipsing around the world and trying to get people to understand these drinks. And then more recently, have co-opened or co-founded and are co-managing a couple of different companies, one in Japan, one in New York, that are working to get these spirits, these amazing secrets of Japan out of the country and into new consumers' hands. And yeah, that's basically, that's my nine to five. It's not really a nine to five. It's more like a six to two, yep. <laughs> honestly, but yeah. 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. I guess yeah, that's that, probably about how. Yeah. You said 6 a.m. Um, to 2 a.m.? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Or or if I'm like, or sometimes it, it, it shifts to 3 to 7 or 7 to 3, whatever. But about that. Yeah. 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 So it's fun. Dang, man. Hey, as long as you're having fun and you love it. There yep, we go. I do. <laughs> so that's what you do. You're an ambassador and you're an ambassador for Japan to other countries. Yeah, for the spirits, not for the country itself. Yes, um, yes. I think I'm still I'm still a couple of decades away from ever being considered for such. I don't know. I'm, I'm way too much of a loose cannon for such a job. But uh, the spirits themselves, as you said before, shochu and awamori, a couple of spirits that outsell sake in Japan and spirits that I argue are Japan's best kept secrets culinary wise. There we go. There we go. Well, tell us a bit more about your motivation. What gets you up and keeps you going every day? Well, I'll be honest. Now it's become the fact that I'm managing a couple of businesses which employ people and the things that I do and the decisions that I make, that we make, uh, are responsible for their livelihood. So that, that honestly is a very big motivator now. It is about the team and making sure that they are doing things that they want to be doing and they feel like they're useful and their time is valuable and that they're moving towards a goal, not only for, you know, the company's goals, but their own personal goals. And so that get, that gets me out of bed. Um, that doesn't allow me to sleep in so much, but the things that really excite me or that excited me before these businesses were, were founded is just introducing these amazing things to new people, to new audiences, to new palettes, to expanding, broadening people's horizons, to adding joy to people's lives. And that's, that's a ton of fun. I mean, I can't tell you, I'm, I'm sure I don't need to explain to anyone that it is quite enjoyable to travel around the world and stand in front of a group of people who are interested in learning something new, pouring them alcohol and giving them snacks, joking around with them and having a great time, you know, wash, rinse, repeat, you know, that sort of lifestyle is what I've essentially set up for myself. So it is, it has been a long time coming, a lot of groundwork and a lot of eating poop for a long time. And I'm nowhere near where I want to be yet, but it has been a heck of a journey. It's a, and it's a ton of fun. So that gets me out of bed. Yeah, man, I feel that adding joy to people's lives by giving them new information about alcohol. Yep. That's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, let's jump into dreams and goals now, man. What are they? What's your vision for your life and your companies? Well, the the vision for, I mean, there's a ton. Um, let's simplify it. Let's, let's keep it. Uh, let's distill this down if we're talking about spirits. 
Um, I would love for these drinks to be in every bar, restaurant, uh, liquor store around the world by the time I die. And if that happens, I will be content in knowing that I had a little something to do with that. Um, these drinks are everywhere in Japan. Like I said before, they outsell sake here at home in their domestic market. And they have done so every year since about 2003, 2004. So it's, it's this massive, massive industry of family-owned businesses that is just hiding in plain sight. To give you an idea of the scale of Japan's shochu and awamori industry, we're talking, uh, okay, there is more shochu and awamori made in Japan every year than tequila in Mexico. Wow. It's a, it's a massive operation and they are, they're under capacity. They have so much excess capacity that they're not even using. So it's bigger than that, that, in, that huge industry. Now, the tequila industry exports about two-thirds of its annual production volume outside the country. A lot of it goes to the States, obviously. Probably the lion's share goes to the States. It's about 66 67% of production. Less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of Japanese shochu and awamori ever leaves Japan. Mm. So it's just, it's just kind of... It's, just coiled up and ready to spring and my goal is to facilitate that in whatever way that I can and primarily right now we are while we are shipping to other countries around the world we're focusing on the United States as our primary target because we feel like well number one I feel because I'm from the states originally I feel like I have some understanding in our company that everybody that I work with is or most of the people I work with are based there and we feel like we get it over there. We feel like we can start the conversation and get people's heads around these crazy, very complicated, very nuanced spirits classes. Um, but from there, we'll use that as the foundation for to total global domination, basically, uh, in terms of not just our company and exporting our, our portfolio, but as in Shochu and Awamori becoming just a regular spirit that you would consider having if you're opening a, a new bar. Oh, well, we got to have tequila. We got to have gin. We got to have whiskey. We got to have rum. We got to have shochu. We got to have awamori because they just end up becoming this really interesting new um, flavor profile that you can slide into the well. You can put it, they can be premium well. They can be on the back bar. There's so many options. There's so many possibilities. And so my overriding goal is to help facilitate that and uh, not really planning to rest until we're most of the way there. I feel that dude. Uh, maybe I'm wrong in saying this. I don't know the market cap for the alcohol market. Sounds like a billion dollar idea to me. I'm like a lot of people drink alcohol. And if it's that well kept in Japan, like getting it out there. Yeah, I, I agree with you. We're, I mean, if we can just capture a single point, a single percentage of the U.S. spirits market. We're talking, yeah, billions of dollars of revenue for the, for these very, a lot of them are really, really small family owned distilleries that I, listen, I live in Tokyo. Some of the stuff that we have in our portfolio that's available in New York, D.C., uh, Georgia, in Chicago, in, on the West Coast, soon in, in Texas, a lot of this stuff, I can't get it in Tokyo. They don't need Tokyo. They're too, they, their production volume is so small and they are so well respected that they're just like, we don't, we don't need that massive metro market. But fortunately, before I ever dreamed of going into business, I'm, I, I was in academia for a long time and I still ostensibly am. But uh, I was, you know, I was, I was just trying to teach myself about these drinks i'm from a beer background in the states i used to brew when i was a i literally was the youngest commercial beer brewer in the united states i was too young to legally drink what i was making and i was immensely proud of myself as a teenager working for a commercial brewery and making their stuff and people lining up to buy it i was oh you could not talk to underage me about beer let me tell you yeah. um but i I had th this fascination with these small craft 
beverage alcohol products that are backbreaking to make, unendingly delicious and interesting. And so when I came to Japan, I ran face first into this entire world of spirits that nobody knew anything about. And it was everywhere. I mean, it was the most taken for granted thing I had ever seen in my life. You could buy shochu and aomori in every supermarket, every convenience store, almost every restaurant and bar had them on the menu. And yet nobody really talked about them. It was just there. It was like, it was like air almost. Yep. And so I just was, I just was fascinated by it. And I spent about a, a almost a decade and a half just going down to the distilleries, meeting the people, becoming friends, helping where I could, getting the word out. And then eventually when it came time to go and find suppliers, because like, screw this, this is, this is taking way too long. I'm going to do it myself. This is, this is a conversation my business partner and I had a, several years ago. Like, let's just do it. Let's just quit our jobs and do it. And we did. Unfortunately, we had those relationships to leverage those friendships, these tiny you know, fifth generation, sixth generation distilleries that didn't even have electricity until the 1980s. And we're like, hey, what do you think? We got a crazy idea. Let's go, let's go to the States. How about that? And they're like, um, <laughs> I don't know what that means. You mean you want us to sell you booze, right? And we're like, yeah, we do. We want to buy it and we want to try and use it to create a new market in the US. We want to create a new category over there. They've never heard of it. Let's try it. You want to be the first ones in? And uh, it took some cajol cajoling. It took some begging and pleading and crying and a little bit of stealing. And uh, eventually they went along with it. Now we have a very, very well curated, small scale portfolio that is among other importers in the States, uh, helping to get people some good stuff that they can calibrate their palate on. And, you know, hey, it's a it's a rabbit hole, man. There are 5000 brands produced in Japan every year. It is a gigantic industry and there's something for everyone. It's just it's it's a little bit inaccessible. There's a language barrier. There is obviously a geographical barrier. There are you know, how do you drink it? How does it compare to these other things? There's just a, a vacuum of information out there. So that's uh, we got our work cut out for us. I guess that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So have these drinks in every bar and liquor store around the world, current dreams and goals. Do you have any others that you want to chat about? Other dreams and goals. I would, if, if we're successful, then I really look forward to doing something not related to alcohol necessarily. Although I don't think I will ever leave the industry because it's too much fun. Um, but I would love to do something that really helps people in another way. And I have a feeling with all of the, with all, the way that the world is going right now and all of the needs out there, and we've got new, you know, we've got uh, intangibles like the climate issues and everything that's going to be affecting populations in different ways. I hope that I will be in a position to spend nearly full time, um, not too long from now, trying to do things to help certain um, underserved populations or communities around the world and whether that is whether that's on an educational level um whether that's women's women's rights and women's um autonomy and just giving them the tools to uh provide for their families in new ways whatever it happens to be i hope that i'm able at a i'll be at a financial point in my life where i can devote time and resources to a project like that so that's if, if I can do that as well, then I will die a very, very happy human. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what is that financial mark for you? And I get that with inflation, it'll probably have to quadruple, but <laughs> um, what's that for you? If you have a number. What's my number? Oh, geez, like, is it the a, number. What is, is the number, number in revenue? Or is it like a net worth number? Or talk to us about it. There's so many ways to crack that egg. I, there's a great book called The Number. I can't remember who wrote it. I apologize to the author because it's a really good book for reshaping the way that you think about these things and what is your number? What are your, what are your financial go goals? What equals security to you long-term? Are you trying to provide for the next generation, future generations of your family? All very, very important questions that everybody 
hopefully in their 20s is beginning to think about. I did not. Um, I missed that boat. But um, there is some truth to the maxim that it's never too late. And I would say, while I haven't figured that number, it's a moving target, it always will be. But I figure if I can get to a point, I think it's, I think it's in terms of, I don't know a more graceful way to put this, but it, it, it comes down to ownership. It comes down to what, what how much of, of the business do I still own or the businesses do I still own or have control over? And what is that, what type of uh, foundation is that laying for my family? Uh, I don't have any hard numbers at this point. We are still very, very new. And, and like you said, there's the sky's sort, or you alluded to the sky being the limit. And I believe it, it pretty much is, but I really don't know what that looks like yet. The, uh, um, the, the company that I just spent a whole month in the States ping-ponging across the country supporting called Honkaku Spirits, which is spelled H-O-N-K-A-K-U, Honkaku, which means, means authentic in Japanese. That company was born in uh, March of 2020. You know, amazing timing. Um, so as you can probably imagine, we've yeah. had... It's been a very interesting experience yeah. thus far. And so we're having to change everything that we set out to do. We've had to turn everything upside down and inside out. Back becomes front, left becomes right, up becomes down. And there's no way out really yet. Um, the, the international shipping situation never wants to get better. The people controlling it, these huge companies controlling it, do not need it to get better because they make more money the more jammed up it is. And it is just, it's pinching and squeezing and bleeding us and it, as it's doing to many, many companies out there. So at this point, for me to even uh, fantasize about what the eventual exit ramp might look like, that's a really, really difficult thing for me to do. And it's not something that I've spent any time on, which I'm sure you can understand. Having, having said that, if I could get to a point where I felt like, um, I would be able to take care of my entire family of this generation plus my own nuclear family next generation and set them on a, on a steady standing, then I'd be pretty satisfied. I know there's a lot of people out there that are, that are going to scoff at that. It's like, oh, those are small peanuts. What are you talking about, man? Um, but again, I guess maybe this is part of my this is part of the, the, the journey. I'm trying to hold my ba myself back from dreaming too big because I'm still just trying to, to figure out how to step over, climb over what's right in front of me right now. Yeah, I feel that. So um, I love what you said there. <laughs> I love two things about what you said. One, how you said a really big goal, actually. And <laughs> you said, I know a lot of people scoff at that. It's funny because I kind of think the same way of like, for the longest time, you know, I was setting my goals. I was in college like a year and a half ago, a year ago. And I was setting my goals coming out of college. And I was like, I want 60,000 a month from three, 20,000 from three businesses. That being real estate, um, life coaching, and, or not necessarily just some type of coaching, some type of helping people become their best self mm -hmm. and uh, day trading. Okay. <laughs> and... <laughs> I'm looking at 60,000 a month now and I'm like 60,000 a month, 720,000 a year. I think I'm pretty sure I did that math, right? I think it's more than that. Is it not? No. 60, oh wait, no, no, you're right. You're right. You got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking I was, I was doing 60,000 from three different um, revenue streams. So I was, I was, tr I was a triple oh, in see, my head. I, see, I, I see. got you. You actually divided it by three. So it's 20, 20, 20. Yes. You got it. Yeah. And yep. Then I listen to people like Grant Cardone. He's like, yep, 10 million a month, 100 million a month. <laughs> and I'm like, man. <laughs> and so stratosphere. Yeah, I'm yeah. not there yet. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. But I love what you said about I try to stop myself from dreaming too big because I, I want to focus on the things right in front of me. And I think while it's good to dream big, it's good to expand your mind by dreaming big. If you spend too much time expanding your mind and then you never get step one, 
you're just yeah. never going to get to your dream. So I'm right there with you. Yeah. Um, and already so many people are doing too many things already. Just, you know, doing yeah. too many things. How is your time best spent? I think is a really good question to ask. And uh, so, yeah, right, right in line with what you're saying, like you need to focus on, there needs to be a step-by-step -step in order to eventually get to the big time. Exactly. And that's one thing I used to say, yeah, big goals, big goals, big dreams, big dreams. But now I'm like, let me just get one client. <laughs> like, let me start with one and then let me figure out how to get the second. And then I can think about getting to a hundred, but it's like, when I'm thinking about getting to a hundred, it's like, oh, well, you need to market to get to a hundred. Well, I don't have a marketing budget. Then you ask yourself, yeah, and you don't, have, and you need people to get to a hundred too. Exactly. So probably. And, and yeah. then you're like, well, why don't you have a marketing budget? Why can't you hire people? It's probably because you haven't gotten one client. <laughs> It's like, we'll get one client. Baby, baby steps, baby yep. steps. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, awesome, man. Any other dreams or goals that you want to chat about real quick? Um, I think, I think I covered the, the big ones there. Just helping people in a couple of different ways, I think are the, the big overarching themes that uh, the, the music that's playing in the background as I, as I stand here at my standing desk <laughs> day yeah. in and day out. <laughs> There we go. Well, if there was one or two people that you can meet right now, this could be a specific person or a type of person, and it'd really help you take the next step toward your dreams and goals. Who would they be and how would they help you out? The, the thing that we really lack right now in both sides of the Pacific Ocean, the two businesses that I'm helping to, to manage are somebody with really, really good digital marketing acumen and that would need to be a person who is comfortable staying at home and or likes to work remotely has a very keen sense of what people are paying attention to how how we should be crafting messages and also helping us to plan and and perhaps even edit content um that type of person is, especially when you're trying to find someone who also has specific content background knowledge or experience vis-a-vis -vis the beverage alcohol industry, it's, they're really difficult to come by. So it wouldn't even need to be the person who is doing that for us, but just the person who could coach us on uh, best practices there. And that would be quite valuable to us. And we've struggled to find a person like that. So that's somebody that I'm always interested in in running into um another person i think just from a mentorship type of perspective i think i'm at a point now where and i've been i have been so lucky let me don't get me wrong i've been incredibly fortunate with the people that have chosen to uh, spend time helping and and advising as these experiments have gotten off the ground and and become self-sustaining but I think, I can't remember who it was, said that you're, you're always going to need that next mentor who's going to take you through that, you know, the next 20 pages of that chapter. Yep. Because it, it, there may be, for certain aspects, there might be a single mentor who can just kind of has this, you know, this view from 30,000 feet who can see pretty much everything that's going on and give you great bumps in the right direction. But more, more specific or like, time specific or process specific mentors. And I think I may be at the point now where I would greatly benefit from someone who can show me how best to be spending my time and how, how not to be, um, not to be chasing things that just don't make any sense for both in the, the short or the long-term success of, of the company. I, I know those are incredibly nebulous things, but people who know about these things will know exactly what I'm talking about. And anybody who's tried to start a business before will absolutely understand where I'm coming from. Um, it's just running a business, starting a business is such an amazing they, they, should give, they should give degrees just for having attempted it. You should get an MBA just for starting your second business. And even if you fail, you know, because you learned it all. Like you learn, you, if you do it by yourself, you do a small team, bootstrap it. Man, what an education, what a ride it is. It's heartbreaking. It's, it's nerve wracking. You don't sleep, you know, everything depends on everything else. 
And it's, I never realized how much I, en- I just enjoyed the process. I would enjoy the process. Yeah. Um, and right now in my journey, I need a little bit of help with fine tuning my approach to that process. So I guess that's the type of person I would like to meet. Gotcha. And so with these, so question for the really, really good digital marketing acumen person. Is this in the form of a digital marketing coach or a digital marketing employee? Or I think it's, it could be, could be both. Um, I think if we can't have the employee, then it may be the coach um, just helping us to, we already have our own sit, uh, systems in place. We have consultants helping. We have the, the, all these different uh, tangential things, this orbit, this, these satellites. And we just need a little bit of an outside perspective on what, what may be working well, what might not be working well. And if we can find somebody to plug into the team who's going to be a great culture fit. And that's what we always hire for is, you know, number one, can you deal with me? Because <laughs> I'm pretty full on a lot of the time. And then, oh, yeah. uh, do you, you know, it, uh, well, it's, uh, you know, I don't sleep a whole lot. So you got you to gotta be able to deal with that. Yeah. Um, and uh, just, yeah, somebody who can plug in. We're all remote. I mean, we've got part of our team is down in southwestern Japan. Another, some more of the team is on the east coast of the United States. We're all, we're all just kind of chiming in at all hours of the day. We've got check-ins and things, and we try to keep it sane. And then people go off and do their thing, and they come back, and we figure out what to do next. So it's pretty wild. It's the new, it's the new, it's the new workplace, you know? Yeah. Things have changed. Yeah, absolutely. And that second person, that just sounds like kind of like a business coach, honestly. Is that what you think it is or are you picturing somebody else? Yeah, it's somebody specifically who can, um, who has that background in, in the digital world and can help us with that. I think we're, we are lacking. Our PR game is pretty good. Um, our general stakeholder management game is quite good. Our, our, it's the, it's the use of the tools that are out there. That's a little bit scattershot and haphazard, which I would love to improve upon. I think a coach is useful, but uh, at the end of the day, we're going to eventually get back to, we just need somebody really, really clever to be doing a lot of this stuff for us. Um, And that's going to be, that's somebody that we've been trying to hire for a long time. And we've never found somebody who fits because it's always, you're either, you're either catching somebody who's on their way up, which is great, but they're, they're not prepared to give you more than probably six months, nine months, 12 months of their time. And then they're going to be gone on to the, the next thing. Or you're dealing with an agency who is going to promise you the world and then not really deliver. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough. So we just got to, we've been very fortunate with building out our team with people that we've run into just out in the normal course of life, often, often related to work but who happened to be tangentially related to the beverage alcohol industry and were in between things or were whatever, and just happened to be really amazing fits. And then things just kind of, fortunately, because we're so small, we have those stories still. I don't know if we were a bigger company, I think it would be a little harder for that to happen quite so often, but um, you know, we're still like what less than 10 people all told. So it's it's nothing. It's still, still a quote unquote family. We like each other. Um, hopefully it stays that way. We hope to stay small, but, uh, who knows, who knows? There we go. Well, that benefit from somebody who can show you how to best spend your time. Is that a business coach or is that more like a time management specific coach or even a life coach? Like, which, like, is it spend your time just across your life or specifically in your business? Yeah, it's business related. I think, I think I'm pretty good with, uh, the, the time management outside of, of business because I don't have a lot of time outside of business. So I both, I mostly just go to bed. Um, But I, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a business coach, I think. Gotcha. I think it is. Um, And, and right now we have a, we have a, a managing director who does a really good job of, of punting me back into my position. Uh, he's like, no, I don't want you wasting your time on that. And let's, let's hand that off to somebody else. Um, but I get, I get, I'm easily distracted. So I end up doing about 10 different things at once, which is one of my great weaknesses. And, uh, 
he's good at kind of keeping me honest. But I think eventually, as we as we add more people to the team and his his attention is more distracted than I'm going to need. I'm going to need an extra set of eyeballs, making sure that I'm not not doing things that really aren't aren't what I do best. And what I probably do best, what arguably I'm I'm most comfortable doing is educating, being out there doing tastings, sales calls, that sort of thing, which which I, I, I enjoy cold calling. I think it's a fun game. I, uh, people hate it and people hate salespeople. I, I, I've been told to get the fuck out so many times over the past month, especially yeah. in New York, man, they do ha- not like walk-ins, but I love it. I think it's fun. And uh, um, so that's, that's where I wish to be spending more of my time is on the education side and building the category and getting people in on the ground floor on this bad boy. But you know, there's so many other things to do and uh, so many, only so many hours in the month. So, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, have you ever read the book, Who Not How? I have not. I think, um, I don't, I mean, you can read the book. It's a pretty who self-explanatory not, book. How? Okay. Yeah. I'm writing uh, it down. It's a fantastic book. I really think though, if you're looking for a business coach, you should go with Dan Sullivan. If you're looking for recommendations, he is the kind of idea man behind Who Not How, and he actually you utilized the concept to write the book. So he's on as an author, but Benjamin okay. P. Hardy wrote the whole book, and he just kind of brought his ideas to life through that book. And he teaches business owners about that Who Not How, which is basically kind of what your business manager is doing already of like making sure you outsource, making sure you do that. But I think, I don't know, he's just been doing it for 50 years, so... He's probably pretty good. I will, I will pick that up and, and read through it. Thank you. That's yeah. If you end up, if you end up uh, going with him, tell him that he owes me some referral money. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> we'll do. I will tell him who sent me. Absolutely. <laughs> no, um, he, he doesn't know who I am, cool. so it won't mean anything, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's he good. will if a couple of people tell him that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, awesome, man. We're going to blow through our thriving three real quick. So okay. what's, your, what's your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one. Um, I'm going to say right now, uh, Proof by Adam Rogers, I think is a great book, which there is about, it's a, basically how you learn about alcohol, how it's made, where it's from, everything from how yeast works to how aging works and done in a very, very enjoyable for the lay person um, audience. So pick that up. It's a fantastic book proof by Adam Rogers. There we go. And what's one way you like to take care of yourself? I, I like to, I like to watch Work. baseball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like to, I like to go to baseball games. Um, baseball. I, you said at the beginning of, of the show, I'm a Tokyo swallows fan. Tokyo swallows are the New York Mets of Tokyo. And they won the championship for the first time in my 20 years last year. I'm a huge fan. And I actually have a podcast that I've been doing for ever called the, you know, the Tokyo Swallows podcast. The first podcast I ever did. Been doing it for more, well over 10 years. Nobody listens to it, but we do it just because we love the team. Yeah. It's three of us, three nerds. And uh, yeah, that's how I take care of myself, I guess. It's the one place where I can go and kind of not think about anything. There we go. And what is one action step you can take right now or continue to take if you're already doing it to really hit your goals of having the financial means and getting those drinks in every bar and liquor store around the world? This is so this is a general piece of advice for everybody is what you're saying, kind of. No, one action step that you can take. So what is okay, your one thing? Step? Well, here's what here's what I well, what I'm going to continue to do is and we can't this is a, a running theme in this in this conversation is managing time. And what I have learned is that I am a sucker for really good serial dramas and movies. I love movies. Um, The Wire almost made me lose my job when I binge watched three seasons in a row. Um, And so I learned that that's that's my Achilles heel. So I cut myself off. Um, I don't watch TV. I don't have a Netflix account. I don't have an HBO Max account. I don't have an Amazon Prime, Hulu, whatever those things are. I've never once touched them. Um, I will not. I, um, I allow myself a single game on my smartphone. And right now it's not even on my smartphone. It's Wordle. 
that I play every morning when somebody reminds me on Twitter that they that they got however many they got in three tries. <laughs> so that's my game. Um, and I basically just cut out all the stuff that is likely to to suck away the time that I need to do this other all this other stuff that's stressing me out. Right. All the million other things that I need to get done. Um, and so time management comes from just not allowing your downtime to get unwieldy and gobble up more than it needs. And uh, we know that just monitors in general, just whether it's your smartphone or whether it's the old fashioned TV idiot box, um, those things can just gobble up time. So I just feel like, hey, if I've got free time, wash my face, brush my teeth, hit the pillow, you know, yeah. that's, that's basically how it works. And then set the, make sure to set the alarm um, and then get, get up and at them again. And I think if I can continue to do that and I can continue to manage my working hours to a, to a similar, now I'll never get there, but if I can do a better job of staying focused on, on tasks that really are, are worth the time, then I, I figure I can be an asset to the companies moving forward. Have you read The One Thing? I think I have. Yes. Yep. It's a good book. It is a good book. Yep. Awesome, man. Well, we have one last question for you. Actually, we okay. have, it's like it's three last questions, but it's all same theme. <laughs> Got you. Okay. Okay. So the question I used to ask on the podcast, this is a new variation of that question. And a lot of people used to say that the catalyst that helps people change from having a really fixed mindset, not willing to accept help and not willing to accept change to having a growth mindset, willing to accept help and willing to accept change. They said that the catalyst is a personal choice that happens after either inspiration or desperation. Mm. Following me? Yep. My question to you is, the first question is, do you agree with that? Do you disagree with that? Anything to add to that or subtract from that? I, I think speaking from experience, I agree with it mostly, but I would add to it that if you have the right people around you, you can come to that growth mindset just by continuing to have the conversations with people who just know more it's essentially a mentor level thing where they can help you to see the problems and the obstacles that you're confronting in a different way and when you hear those same things again and again and again you're like yeah you're right okay maybe i do need to try it differently or yep. or, or approach this from a different perspective so i think i'm going to add that little wrinkle to it it can be coached there we go there we go and why do you think some people make the choice to change and then others don't make the choice given the same inspiration or given the same desperation it's it all right, that's a that's a really good question my knee-jerk reaction to it is it's ego i think it's probably people i mean how many success stories do we have in our midst right now who are just people who don't listen to anybody yeah and and especially in American society, American culture, um, for better, and I think mostly for worse, is the, the ultra independence and how the individual is so important and how that's, that's coached into us from a young age and how we're like, no, I know how to do it best. I'm going to rely on myself and you have to be confident in yourself. And I think that's important up to a certain extent, but a lot of people have a have a pretty deep chip in their shoulder chip on their shoulder fat chip on their shoulder deep chip in their shoulder i'm not sure what that expression is supposed to be and uh, they're not uh, not able to get around it they're not uh, able to get out of their own way and so um it's not about the businesses that i'm managing are not about me it's that's one thing i've I've learned, I, every day I learned three, at least three new things that I suck at. I am terrible at these things. I should not be doing these things, but we, we don't have the people to do them and they need to be done now. So I end up taking them on. And that's a great lesson in humility. Yeah. And a, a lesson that I needed a long, long, long time ago, repeatedly. And I'm fortunate to finally be getting it. Um, 
And I think that I'm partly open to, and I'm not saying that I've got a totally uh, textbook growth mindset, but I do know how to listen to people who I know know better than me. And uh, I'm happy to collaborate and I'm happy to invite people to disagree with me just because I've learned that much better things come from it. Yep. Um, it's not about me. Yeah. It really isn't. And that, that takes a long time for people to, uh, some people it takes forever. Some people it's impossible, um, but you can get there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love that ego. And what do you think establishes the threshold at which inspiration or desperation will topple over our ego? Well, I mean, at desperation, it's basically, it's a do or die situation. So I think that's, that one's a little easier um, because you just don't have a choice. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. going out of business. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and I, I'm laughing just because I've, I've been there. Well, I've been there several times, so I get it. I'm laughing not because it's funny. I'm laughing because I'm laughing so as not to cry. <laughs> yeah. um, the, for, in, for the inspiration side, the toppling point, where is it? I guess it's, it's at a point where you finally don't need to ask people for permission anymore. Um, you, you see it so clearly. You're so, you're so lifted by whatever that experience what it was, whatever that meeting was, whatever you heard, you saw, you, you, you felt that you don't have to ask, you don't have to ask yourself. You don't have to ask anybody for permission to take action. And that that's a level of inspiration that, man, if I could capture that in a bottle and sell it, man, we, I, you know, I would be, <laughs> yeah. I would be able to sleep at least four hours a night. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you've got to sleep more. <laughs> sleep is cool. <laughs> well, awesome. Awesome. And how can we create an environment that facilitates people making that choice to change? Yeah, I don't I wish I I wish I had that answer. The only thing that I can say just from the perspective of managing people um, and trying to just put them in a place to succeed is it's a it's if we're talking about an employee employer relationship then i'm thinking about trust it's all about trust and you have to give people the space and i'm i'm speaking in clichés right now so i apologize but you have to give people the space to fail you have to encourage them to to have the confidence in themselves that they can they can take small risks and try and move the needle in whatever direction the team is trying to go um, and then, and, and not be afraid to be held accountable or responsible for things that don't quite go as planned. Um, just knowing that it's going to work out, we're going to figure it out and we're going to find a better way. And I suppose if you create that type of culture, if you allow people that kind of space, that breathing room and can engender a type of, of desire to do things that do things for the company that also just make them feel good about being part of that team, then I think you're going to set them up for just allowing that inspiration to really take hold of them and express in a way that benefits everyone. If you're, if you're just, if you're forcing people to experience these things in a vacuum, it, you, they experience, they find inspiration, they find things that move and lift them and they don't share these things. If you've created that culture in your company, then they're, they're working for somebody else already. And I think a big part of the challenge for me is figuring out how each person is, is at their best side by side with everybody else that we've has chosen to spend their time with us. And uh, that's where, one thing I've, I've learned, and I, and I mean this completely and earnestly and honestly, is like, they're not working for me. I'm working for them. I, I really feel like I'm working for these people. And, and, and I'm grateful for it. I'm immensely proud of the fact that I get to work for them. And if I can be better at this, I think the inspiration is going to lift everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I really love that. 
creating that environment where, you know, there's trust, people have that space to fail, but they're also held accountable for the risks that they do take and the actions that they take. Um, I feel like that tension between accountability and uh, trust is a hard one. Oh, it's, it's impossible. I mean, it's <laughs> ego again, I think. It's, yeah. really, it's, not, it's almost impossible, just people... Um, people don't like to don't like to be shown that they didn't do it the way they probably could have. Yeah. Um, people don't like to be made to look silly, which I, I, I get. And we try very hard to make sure that that doesn't happen. And, and fortunately, fortunately there are more adult people in the room than me who know how to craft those messages and know how to talk to people in a, when times are tough. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, learning, learning to, you know, the, take responsibility for, for your, the consequences of your actions and being fine with that and moving on from it and not dwelling on it. Um, you know, not, not constantly looking back at, you know, you can't change what happened before. Let's just change what's going to happen next or affect what's going to happen next. Yeah. The, the best we can. Let's learn from our mistakes. And if you can create a situation that is con conducive to that, and it's not easy and I don't have all the answers, but if you can do that, then you're, you're cooking with, with gas. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. 100%. Well, awesome. Christopher, is there anything else that you want to chat about before we sign off? Um, I, I just, a, one, if I can make one other book recommendation, um, actually two, one is um, by my uh, business partner, Stephen Lyman. It's called the, Com the complete guide to Japanese drinks. I think that's a great place. If you want, more information about Japanese whiskey, shochu, awamori, sake, things that come in cans, definitely check that book out. It's great. It was nominated for a James Beard Award a couple of years ago. It's a great reference. Another reference, this one I contributed to, just came out late last year, is the Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails, which is, and I have a, well, actually I have both of these right here if I move a couple of things. This thing you could is a weapon. It's a, it's like it's huge. Look at this thing. It's that big. Oh my it's gosh. a beautiful thing. Uh, edited by David Wondrich, who's a, a renowned cocktail historian, and with help from Noah Rothbaum, who's um, a constant collaborator of his, and just great things to have. Great, great gifts. I would say for anybody who really likes drinks that you know in your life. So those, let me show Steven's book real quick. Just, this is the complete guide to Japanese drinks. Um, and I think those would be very useful for, for anybody who wants to geek out on these drinks like I do every day of my life. There we go. Well, awesome. Awesome. Christopher, thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And hopefully we can do this again in a few years and, and see, see if things that we talked about today have any bearing on how things played out. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And um, if you guys are listening to this and you loved what Christopher had to say, you're interested in some Japanese drinks, make sure to pick up the complete guide or the Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails. Buy it for a friend. Also, if you happen to know somebody really, really good at digital marketing, or who can be Christopher's business coach, i.e. Dan Sullivan, who will give me a commission on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, make sure to connect them to Christopher. Guys, thanks for watching. As we always ask, shoot this podcast to one to three people you know need to hear this message. Give us a five-star review on iTunes and we're out.